Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. Today, October 10th, 2022, we are excited to present Energy Security After Ukraine, What are the Challenges and Opportunities for the U.S. and its Allies? My name is Jack Capizzi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that the expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today's panel includes George Fibb, partner at Baker Botts and the former Deputy General Counsel of the Department of Energy, Professor James Coleman, Professor of Law at the Dedman School of Law at Southern Methodist University, and our moderator, Daniel West, who is the uh, Executive Committee member for the International and National Security Law Practice Group here at the Federalist Society. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please just enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle the questions as we can towards the end of the program. With that, thank you for being with us today. Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jack. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Today, we'll discuss energy security, a topic that is most pressing today in Western Europe, but that has also become increasingly urgent for the United States and its allies elsewhere in the world. We'll start by discussing the recent events in Russia and the Ukraine. The energy sector has played an important role in the strategies and events surrounding that conflict. We'll discuss the legal and policy levers available to the U.S. and allied countries to help Western Europe disentangle itself from dependence upon Russian oil and gas, and to suppress Russian exports from simply migrating to other countries. We'll then shift to the Western Hemisphere and discuss energy security from the perspective of the United States. We'll consider the legal and policy levers available for the U.S. to increase production of fossil fuels and renewable energy equipment and technologies for use both domestically and by our allies abroad. We'll also talk about the opportunities and challenges posed by the ongoing energy transition from the perspective of national security. So let's jump in and let's start with the headlines. Russia's invasion of the Ukraine obviously jolted energy markets earlier this year. We saw oil prices spike well above $100 a barrel and natural gas prices rising as much as 10 times their previous levels in some parts of Europe. But I'd like to start actually by backing up before the invasion. Do you think that European dependence on Russian energy emboldened Russia by creating or perhaps widening a perceived opportunity there? And have European nations, and has Germany in particular, reacted differently than they would have if they had not been reliant upon imported energy? Yeah, so on the first question, I think it's undoubtedly true that part of the reason that Russia invaded was because they saw an opportunity caused by high energy prices. And I think uh, that is actually more true than the idea that somehow the war caused high oil prices. So if you look at oil prices today, they're about $93. That's about exactly the same price that they were before the war started. So basic, and there have been a huge run up in oil prices. Um, from basically November 2020 to the start of the invasion, which was in February of this year, 2022. And the basic reason for that was nothing to do with Russia, but was simply an imbalance in global supply and demand, which was that demand for oil came back faster than people were expecting after the pandemic, but oil production didn't rebound as quickly. So, uh, Basically, for the entire year of 2021, you know, long before Russia invaded, the world was consuming more oil than it was producing. In fact, it was consuming about 100 million barrels per day of oil, but it was only producing 98 million barrels per day of oil. So there was 2 million barrels per day of oil short every day of 2021. You might ask how that's possible, and that's because oil can be stored. And so and this was also before the Strategic Petroleum Reserve releases. So this was all oil coming out of private stores around the world. And as we got to very low levels of private storage, oil prices tended to rise, actually, you know, basically doubled over the course of that drawdown of our uh, oil, of our oil, private oil reserves. And uh, as a result, Russia saw an opportunity, which is that, you know, it's, energy weapon of being able to cut off those oil and gas supplies to Europe or people that oppose it was never more powerful than before that. So I think that was one of the key motivations for uh, Russia's invading when it did. So I, I would agree with uh, Professor Coleman. I guess, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to uh, thank you, Dan, and, and thanks to the Federal Society for for having me join and, and Professor Coleman for, for having me share the, the panel with you. Um, and, and I couldn't agree more with, with those initial comments. I guess what, what I would add to that um, beyond just the leverage that, 
uh, was that, that Russia perceived that it had. You know, part of your question, Dan, was about um, uh, would Europe have reacted differently than it did to the war had it not been so reliant on uh, Russian um, uh, Russian gas and, and oil. And you know, I think I guess one point I would like to make for folks is that. That's a very different question if you're talking about Western Europe, like Germany and the UK, than it is if you're talking about countries that are that were closer to Russia. Um, and over the last uh, however many years, 30 years, uh, 20 years, have been uh, have continued to be, and for good reason, more skeptical and less open to doing as much business with Russia. That is like Poland, for example. So, so if you were Polish and you were thinking about your relationship with Russia, that's very different from, from a country like Germany. Um, since you asked about Germany specifically, though, I guess the comment I would make there is that um, I, I think for sure their um, reaction in a lot of ways would be different to the war um, and, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, had they not been so reliant on, on Russia for natural resources. You know, um, I, I just point out that wasn't too long ago, um, the Germans were using words like, uh, they were calling the Americans neo-imperialists and things like that for suggesting that they were too dependent on Russian natural resources and trying to get them to pivot more to, to other sources. And so, um, uh, you know, you look at Germany today and their uh, economy or, or energy minister um, is uh, leading light in the Green Party. And so had they not been so reliant on Russia and something like this had, had come up, I, I think their politics would have been very different. The internal politics would be very different in Germany. Whereas, you know, now you have the same folks who are calling the U.S. neo-imperialists and other, other names um, are, are, have, have, to their credit, made a very quick pivot um, to a, a very practical engagement with, you know, with their sort of immediate rather desperate needs for, for other sources of energy, um, you know, and, and have, as I understand it, made a lot of outreach to, um, you know, U.S. companies and others um, to try to, to fill the need that they're going to have this winter. Um, at the same time, even in such a crisis, the, the German um, energy minister still says he doesn't want to be, quote, too successful, unquote, in um, uh, importing LNG and, and uh, natural gas elsewhere, um, because you know they still maintain their goals of, of largely or all renewable or low carbon sources of energy by 2035. So, so to some extent, there's still a mixed message from Germany, but their actions are, you know, have have engaged very quickly with the reality that they're facing. Mm -hmm. So recognizing the diversity of policies and political situations and just geographic situations across Europe, it, it does look like it's been painful so far and, and the winter may be even more painful ahead. What are the legal and policy tools available, whether it's to NATO, to the U.S., others around the world to help Europe decrease its dependence on Russian energy? Um, James, I can take the first shot at this one. I, I, I just say that the, the biggest issue here um, in a lot of ways is, is timing, is that the, there aren't a lot of short-term levers to pull when it comes to uh, sort of legal, that we haven't already pulled that is, when it comes to, to legal and policy groups. Um, they're much more medium and long-term. And so, you know, when we were thinking about this, this webinar, um, I, I thought about the sort of policy tools that, that um, are available to the executive in particular um, in these kinds of situations. And, and the one that, that uh, I came back to is the Defense Production Act. So if you're thinking about specific legal authorities available to a president, um, this president in particular has been very willing to exercise that authority. I guess, and just stepping back briefly, the Defense Production Act is a, um, a law that came into effect in 1950 uh, during the Korean War. and you know, typically fairly seldom used, but fundamentally what it can do, it's, it's a very broad authority when you look at it. Um, and what it can do is allow the president, you know, upon declaring that certain circumstances exist, and I'll, I'll get to that because I think it's interesting what they are, um, 
the, the president can um, prioritize certain contracts for certain types of supplies that may be needed for national defense, can allocate scarce supplies um, in the U.S. economy to certain um, uh, national defense needs, and then take you know, kind of other broad uh, measures, uh, kind of you know, essentially stepping into the economy and reordering things. The, the, the authority is broad. The details are very difficult and very complex. So not to get too much into the weeds about prioritizing and rating contracts and things like that. It, it can get very difficult very fast, but, but I would just say that um, the, the, the authority was invoked, I believe, twice in the Trump administration, um, once having to do with um, the pandemic with ventilators and things like that, and, and once having to do with some critical minerals. Um, but in, in the short tenure so far of this administration, um, this administration has already used the Defense Production Act in the energy sector, and it's already used it multiple times, more times, I think, than has been used, and in, and for for different uses. So for California wildfires, for fire hoses, for you know, sort of very defense-oriented uh, posture for parts and labor for uh, Virginia-class submarines, um, for critical minerals for clean energy, that is, cl critical minerals for renewables. So the, this president has already used this authority to dip into um, uh, areas of energy security um, and energy transition for the baby formula shortage. Um, and then uh, most recently uh, for uh, what the presidential memorandum called green energy uh, resources. So in other words, the president has said, and, and here's the key language, that, um, that there is a... Uh, he needed to take this action to avert an industrial resource or critical technology item shortfall that would severely impair national defense capability. And in, when it comes to green energy, the president made that finding as to solar energy, heat pumps, insulation, electrolyzers for hydrogen uh, production, fuel cell production, um, things like that. So just looking at what authorities are available, this is a rather broad one that this president has already used in, I, I would say it's fair to characterize as a fairly aggressive way in the energy space. So, so just a thought there in terms of short term, um, you asked about legal levers, um, you know, in the medium term, I think you, you want to talk about medium to long term, you want to talk about um, LNG exports and even, even coal exports, because of course Germany has now had to fire up um, coal plants and, and, you know, they, they need the raw materials to fuel those at full capacity to, to prevent problems this winter and the following winter. So anyway, I'll stop there and, and let James chime in, but a couple quick thoughts on levers. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, and I think the big challenge, the whole reason you got into a, a crisis is because there are no short-term solutions that immediately solve the problem. But, you know, of course, the short-term eventually adds up to the long-term. And I think that's one of the areas where we have seen the Biden administration not do everything they could, because it is undoubtedly true that uh, Europe and the rest of the world is looking to the United States for supplies of oil and gas. So going into the pandemic, the U.S. was the leading uh, source of in incremental oil and gas supplies. Uh, for Europe now with Russia, gas, uh, you know, gas supplies basically ramped down to almost zero. They are looking to the U.S. for liquefied natural gas supplies, and we are sending them a huge amount of liquefied natural gas. In fact, our liquefied natural gas exports to Europe have surpassed that of Russian supplies, which are now almost zeroed, up, zeroed out. So, um, so what the U.S. needs to do is produce oil and gas. And unfortunately, uh, we haven't been doing that. I mean, when we look at why is our U.S. oil production, why didn't it recover from the pandemic when we started having high prices, uh, you know, in the fall of 2020, winter 2021, uh, you know, basically, there are three reasons, right? One is that the oil industry had the same kind of supply chain challenges that other industries had with, you know, losing workforce, with losing equipment, with losing all the things that they need to do to drill, complete a well, bring that oil and gas to market. But there's a couple other challenges that they face that are a little bit more unique. One challenge is that they were facing pressure 
from investors who question what is the long term future of oil? Because remember, you know, the the president had during the campaign said, look at my eyes. I'm going to end fossil fuels. And so you can imagine that investors were wary of uh, of, you know, contribute to an industry's growth that the the uh, president had marked for uh for for end for its end and um and then I think the third thing that happened is that there were specific you know regulatory decisions by the Biden administration that have created challenges for the oil and gas industry you know the thing that the president has the most control over is leasing decisions on federal land so offshore oil and gas as well as federal lands which are one of the which were one of the big crucial areas where oil and gas production was growing in federal lands in New Mexico on the um, on the border of Texas there in the Permian Basin. And the president has leased less land than any of his predecessors going back more than half a century. So he really um, has, you know, has prioritized limiting oil and gas production over increasing it. And that's creating, you know, big challenges um, for the for the entire world it's not just europe but we're seeing you know uh outages caused by lack of natural gas in south asia where in southeast asia we're seeing um we're seeing lots of you know fuel the fuel price based instability around the world and that you know all could be alleviated by more um, american oil and gas production now you know once uh you know if the president was to change his mind and start leasing more land it's going to take you know, months, maybe a year, maybe more for that production to come online. Now, but with that said, you know, remember the oil and gas market started flashing warnings in, you know, as soon as he got into office in January 2021. So we had refineries shutting down. We had, even though there were elevated prices, oil and gas companies not investing in new development in the way that they traditionally do. And so if he had, you know, changed course at that time and allowed more oil and gas production uh, that would be starting to help us by now. And I think it's important to understand that these high oil and gas prices that we are currently experiencing may well continue for quite a ways. When we look at natural gas specifically uh, in Europe, most of the signs we're getting is that next winter will be worse than this one in terms of natural gas shortages and potential electricity shortages. Um, As for oil, it's harder to predict, but it's very possible that we're going to have, um, you know, a, a further disruption. Now, one thing that the president has tried to do is release oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Now, that's uh, not as good a way to address these kind of challenges because although it does lower prices temporarily, it leaves you more vulnerable to future disruptions. And in fact, I, we'll talk about this more. But the president has uh, half emptied the reserve, so it is levels. It is. It's half empty down to levels that it hasn't been since the 1980s. So we are less protected against an oil disruption than we have ever been uh, in, uh, you know, in the history of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve over the last 40 years. And so that suggests that, uh, you know, maybe that bet will pay off and he's been able to lower prices and we won't have a future disruption. But if we do have a future disruption, we're unfortunately less prepared for it. So I think, you know, that is a way to potentially in a short term lower oil prices, but it's not a good way. Um, it's a it's a way that imposes its own risks. Now, James, if I could just follow up quickly, you and George both mentioned LNG, liquefied natural gas. Could you talk just for the benefit of our listeners, what is LNG? How do we liquefy it? And why are gas prices, you know, more different in different geographies than oil prices are? Yeah, absolutely. This is really important to understand. So, and this is part of a bigger transition that our world is making because historically, the two energy commodities that created the modern world were coal for industries and cities and oil for transport because oil is a very energy dense fuel. It's the fuel you can carry with you to power your plane or your your vessel, et cetera. And there's really nothing to replace those. Now, we're going to cleaner sources of energy like natural gas and uh, electricity. The big challenges with those sources, although they're cleaner, you can use natural gas and electricity in your house as long as you're safe about it. Don't use coal or oil in your house generally. But um, but the big challenge is transporting them because of course, natural gas as a gas is very difficult to transport. And because it's difficult to transport, uh, you get lots of price spikes and price volatility. Same thing is true of electricity supplies. Because with coal or oil, if there's a shortage somewhere and prices spike, of course, any place that has lower cost oil or coal will send it to help smooth out 
that price spike because you can send it by water, by rail, by road, uh, by pipeline in the case of oil. By contrast, with natural gas or electricity, if there's a shortage of natural gas or electricity, there is no short-term way to just shift more supplies there. You would have to take years and billions of dollars to build a new natural gas pipeline or a power line. Now, one advantage that natural gas has over electricity is it can be shipped overseas, although it is very expensive to do so. The way you do that is by liquefying it because, and the way you liquefy it is you bring it down most of the way to absolute zero. So you refrigerate it to a very low temperature, minus 170 Celsius, and it basically gets 400 times smaller. Now, the facility at which you do that typically they're gonna run you about $30 billion. So they're very expensive facilities. Uh, the US is now the world's number one liquefied natural gas exporter, has built a lot of that capacity on the US Gulf Coast. After you refrigerate it till it's a liquid, you put it on a refrigerated vessel, that vessel costs quarter billion dollars as well, you ship it overseas. And that's adding some flexibility to the market that US liquefied natural gas is helping to meet Europe's current challenge but it's nothing like the kind of transport, you know, easy transport, flexible movements that we take for granted in the oil and coal systems. Thanks, Juan. Uh, the only thing I would add to the explanation of, of LNG there, I guess, two points. Um, you know, it is also it was referred to by my former colleagues at the Department of Energy, Mark Menzies and, and Steve Winberg, as as molecules of freedom when they were talking about uh, exporting LNG to to Europe. Um, and so I you know, we don't want that phrase to die. Um, but uh, the, the only other thing I would add is that Germany looking to, to uh, LNG as a possible um, as to help their situation has leased, I believe, four, maybe five um, uh, floating platforms to regasify the LNG. So, so when you offload the cargo, it has to be heated back up safely uh, and turned back into, into natural gas and that's what we call the regas facility and there are floating platforms that can do that and, and Germany's uh, sort of quickly investing in, in whatever they can get a hold of uh, in terms of those platforms. Molecules of freedom, that's a, it's a, it's a great term. Maybe, maybe using that as a segue to molecules of aggression, you might say that the Russian oil and gas today that's, that's not going into Europe, you know, where is it going? Is it shut up in Russia or, or not? Um, it seems that shipments of Russian oil to China and India have actually significantly increased since the invasion. And they now account for over half of Russia's seaborne exports going to China and to India. And these transactions are increasingly taking place directly in rubles and Indian rupees or rubles and Chinese renminbi. So they're evading the dollar-based financial system. Uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, he recently said, quote, every barrel of Russian crude oil delivered to India has a good portion of Ukrainian blood in it. End quote. So it's a nice contrast with your molecules of freedom there, George. Um, you know, and, and other Asian countries, including Japan and South Korea, have begun to phase out Russian oil imports. So the, the question for you is, have the efforts to suppress Russian exports been effective? Do we expect any enduring impact from this conflict on energy production? Or are oil tanker routes and mineral supply chains, are they just going to reroute over time into anti-Russia and, and Russia tolerant blocks? Well, the first thing I'd say about this is it's not 100% clear to me that we have really looked to reduce Russia's exports of energy. And maybe that goes back to your first question, because Europe and the world is so dependent on Russian oil and gas, actually um, cutting off completely if Europe, I mean, basically Russia has stopped sending natural gas to Europe. It's not that Europe cut off use of Russian natural gas because Russia found more utility in foregoing the money and just saying, I'm going to let you, you know, freeze in the dark. Then, uh, then Europe had the courage to to block that off. And maybe that would have been different if they had had more natural gas supplies, both domestically um, and from the United States. Um, the same thing is true of oil, right? So, you know, the so when um, when the Biden administration said, okay, well, we're not going to import Russian oil products. Well, the U.S. really imported very few. Russian oil products. There were a couple situations where it was mildly useful, but it really wasn't, that wasn't a big, that was a big thing. And the um, the Biden administration, I think our signs are really intended that oil to go elsewhere, because the problem is if that oil isn't sent elsewhere and really Russia stopped producing it, that would have a big impact on these global pretty liquid 
oil markets, which is that if you lose some supply, that means everybody else has to bid up those amounts. And remember, the Biden administration is going around the world asking everybody for more oil. So the last thing they want is for Russia um, to actually reduce this production. So I would say that's mostly for show. I mean, one way we can tell is that, you know, in the response to those initial sanctions, they um, some companies stopped taking Russian oil because they basically it wasn't worth the PR headache. Right. And so, you know, there was like a big, you know, there's a famous um, amount that Shell had taken and they said, well, you know, it was a really good deal. And then they had wanted to, you know, they want to back off of that. Um, but one thing that the Biden administration kind of was saying behind the scenes in that was like, no, no, please don't stop taking oil, because if people really stopped taking Russian oil, it, it would have um, oil prices would spike again. So I don't think that's the intent of the um, the Biden administration. And I think um, so. I think they're not too worried about uh, other countries taking oil because, you know, basically, if those countries buy more Russian oil, that leaves more oil for somebody else. Uh, to take. And so basically, supplies just shuffle around and prices shouldn't be too effective. So, so uh, Dan, I'd add just a little bit to that. And so I think that, that um, it's too soon to tell in terms of, of rerouting of, of uh, sort of reordering of trade blocks or anything that dramatic. Um, just, just way too early to tell about that. I think that. Um, uh, traditional um, uh, sort of rivalries or, or uh, relations among states is, or, 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 you know, will persist. Like, for example, the, um, the, the Chinese and Indian relations, it's not, it's not like they're likely to form any kind of voluntary sort of trade block, even if their behavior may ultimately be the same in terms of like buying Russian oil or, or what have you. Um, but I, I guess I would also add when it comes to specific sanctions and things like that, I think what's more interesting to watch is the, um, you know, Russia's access to the capital markets and to technology um, that could could ultimately have an effect on Russia in the, in the long run, in a in a big way. Um, and as to your quote on um, the Ukrainian uh, the Ukrainian government saying, you know, there's blood and there's blood on that oil. I, I mean, I think the nations that are going to be open to buying the commodity or, or in some ways desperate to have it. I don't think that sort of that, as, as powerful a statement as that is, I don't think that sort of browbeating is going to make much of a difference in terms of, of buying and selling the commodity. Yeah. Let me, let, me, let me say one more thing about, I mean, so there's, so in early December is when we might have some kind of embargo or Russian oil price cap. That's another thing that has, you know, supposedly been negotiated. And, um, you know, the idea is that we're going to try and say that countries shouldn't pay too much for Russian oil. Now, that has been in flux for months and months. Um, whether it's actually implemented, uh, we'll see. I mean, you know, if the response of the Russian government to that was, well, then we just won't sell it. Again, that would be just like taking oil off the uh, off the global market from Russia that could have a big run up in oil prices. So there is this, you know, uncertainty point in in uh, coming in early December. My sort of assumption is that we'll see what we've seen before, which is that nobody really wants Russia to stop selling its oil, but we'll see. Well, so let's shift then from Europe over here to the United States and I'd like to ask, what can we do to increase our own energy security? And what are the options available to us here at home and what are the challenges for us to increase our own energy security? And let's start first with oil and gas and then let's move later to nuclear power and renewable. Um, so Dan, I'll, I'll kick it off with a few thoughts. Um, first of all, I think thinking about energy security, um, uh, I'll, I'll echo some sentiments from um, some of my former colleagues at the at the Department of Energy that you know that there was law often described as sort of an all of the above strategy or an all in strategy. I mean, I think fundamentally, um, a lot of folks think about energy security rather simply in terms of more energy, um, just more energy, more diverse, uh, more diverse, diverse sources of it, and more redundancy. Is, is a fairly straightforward way to think about energy security. 
each each particular source of energy we'd be looking at, we could start with talking about um, oil and gas, um, uh, has its own particular features that, that have uh, security benefits and and drawbacks. And you know, um, uh, we can they're well known. We don't need to rehash those here in terms of of you know what the security traits are. I would say though, what I, when we were talking thinking about this panel, I, I went back and thought about um, sort of the last time, maybe it wasn't the last time, but one time in American history when when um, uh, energy security was front of mind, and particularly in the 1970s and with Jimmy Carter. I think it's it's absolutely fascinating to go back and watch President Carter's speeches in early 1977 when they created the U.S. Department of Energy and um, uh, uh, and, and kind of unveiled their comprehensive energy policy, you know, um, when, when we were really, really in a bad situation. And Carter, just to, to kind of kick off the Carter conversation, the upshot of, of Carter's speech was that we've got a, a big problem, that we're beholden to foreign supplies of oil and gas, that we're going to run out of gas in the very near term. Um, and so we need to do several things. Number one, we need to conserve. Uh, number so, so conservation was sort of the, the hallmark. Uh, number two, we need to invest in coal because it's, we've got a, a lot of it. It's plentiful and can supply our energy needs. And then we also need to invest in um, uh, renewable energy technologies. It's a very interesting program when you look back on it in retrospect. And shortly after that, Congress even passed a law known as the Fuel Use Act, which, um, which prohibited new natural gas um, generation. For that, that law stayed on the books for about a little less than 10 years, I believe, um, before it was, it was repealed. But, um, you know, those were very aggressive steps. I, I think it's very interesting to think about um, conservation, now we would call it energy efficiency as a, a, a sort of, um, uh, people don't really think about that as part of the energy mix, but it, it really is. It's from an economic perspective, using less of something is just as good as having more of it. The only question is is uh, what the cost of that is. And so um, anyway, just a, a few opening thoughts that if you go back and look at when we were really in a, in a previous crisis, we made a lot of pretty dramatic policy decisions, including the creation of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which, which James mentioned. Um, and and I, I do want to, we can kind of come back to the SPR because I agree with James's comments earlier that, that you know, the, the drawdown that this administration is talking about on an emergency basis um, of the SPR is, is a bit concerning for all the reasons that James mentioned, that if there is a uh, 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 an issue in the Middle East, if there's a, another major hurricane that wipes out production in the Gulf of Mexico for a period of time the way Katrina did, um, then you know it's a tool that, that we could have had available and we won't. So uh, I'll echo, when it comes to oil and gas, I'll echo that um, sort of the, the drawdown of SPR, the way it's being done right now on an emergency basis is, is you know, maybe not a great idea. So a couple of thoughts, hopefully that'll help kick off a little more discussion. Yeah, here's the way I think about it is that really security comes from having energy transport and energy storage. Because if you can transport energy, then you can get, you can take it from where you have abundant energy and bring it to the place that's experiencing a shortage. And if you have energy storage, then you can have uh, you can store it in anticipation in anticipation of higher prices in the future or shortage in the future. And so I think those are two of the basic requirements for a secure, affordable, um, and really smooth, you know, reliable energy system. And they are just much more challenging with new sources of energy. So, you know, I do, I do think it's important to think about, we, you know, Carter was looking at a time where there was still, you know, oil, there was still a fair amount of oil power, right? At that time. And there was a lot, and there was a lot of coal power. And those are sources that you can basically, you can store a lot of them 
pretty easily. And um, that meant, um, you know, that meant, look, conserve a little, we'll just use a little bit less, we'll have a little bit more, uh, we will have to draw a little bit less uh, out of storage, et cetera. With natural gas, um, and especially with renewable energy, it's a very different uh, challenge because we're moving our grid to our, our energy system in general, not just electricity, but also transportation uh, and heating to dependence on electricity. Right, because we're moving towards electric vehicles, we're moving towards electric heating and heat pumps. Right now, the big challenge is the electric system is just more fragile than our traditional oil and coal-based uh, systems. And you know, the reason I say that is the electricity grid has to manage every second how much power is being provided from all the hundreds of power generators attached to it, and balance that exactly with how much power is being demanded every time you plug in your phone, plug in your laptop, your air conditioning kicks up, your uh, you know your dishwasher goes on, you plug in your electric vehicle. And it has to be kept in exact balance. And if there's even a slight imbalance, the whole grid can go down and we have a giant catastrophe. So you know, remember 2021, that whole year, we're 2% short of oil. In Texas, the blackouts that we had 18 months ago, right, those blackouts, that was one of the big major causes of that was for just four and a half minutes, there was a tiny imbalance between how much power was being put on the grid and how much power was being taken off. More power was being taken off. And so the grid fell by about 1%. It's frequency, typically oscillates 60 times a second, fell down to 59.3. And that started to break the machines attached to the grid and basically make them kick off of the grid, which started a chain reaction. So there wasn't enough power on the grid. And as a result, we had almost a week of blackouts, billions of dollars of damage, and it could have been even a much worse catastrophe. And so you think about um, the contrast between our oil system, where we can go a year without balance in that system, and the electricity system, which always has to maintain exact balance. And that's possible, but it's only possible if you have you know, enough um, storage of energy in one form or another and enough transport to get that energy where you need it. And frankly, it's getting harder to build a lot of that transport and storage. So it's harder, getting harder to build natural gas pipelines. It's getting harder to build electricity pipelines. It's getting harder to build any of those big infrastructure projects that are necessary to make sure we can get natural gas and electricity where it's needed to always maintain the grid in balance. And that has huge human consequences if it means that our, if we're making our transport system uh, and our heating system depend on the reliability of this system that can be quite fragile if we don't have enough transport and storage. So really, I mean, I think, I think, and this is well understood, solar and wind don't help us meet that challenge. They provide some extra electricity sometimes, right? And that's great. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. It lets us, it means we don't have to run our natural gas power plants as often. But in terms of the actual security of the system, you should be looking for storage. So it's like batteries. So other methods of storage. So, you know, there are, People use pumped hydro storage. There are lots of different um, kinds of storage that are available, but those are really the key to ensuring that we have a reliable and secure energy system. And this is just going to get more and more challenging as we move away from those, you know, dirtier but quite useful sources, oil and coal. Let's talk more about that, James. I mean, you mentioned electric power, and when you think about renewables and nuclear power. Um, even before the subsidies included in the recent Inflation Reduction Act, wind and solar power generation have been growing rapidly, especially here. All three of us live in Texas, and it's huge. For it. Sometimes over 20% of our electric power comes from renewables. Um, nuclear, on the other hand, has not grown materially in decades across the United States, but it does produce reliable carbon-free domestic power. Um, and a lot of countries around the world, France and South Korea are two common examples, get a great deal of their power from, from nuclear. So what is the role for these technologies, both renewables and nuclear, to, to play in U.S. energy security? And can you discuss the challenges they pose to U.S. security, particularly with respect to the supply chain for key minerals and, component, and components in, uh, in renewable equipment? Yeah, I can start out with this because it's, it's a little related. So, you know, the, I think the the, the things to understand, one, about nuclear, let me tell you why we absolutely need to keep running the nuclear power plants that we have, because if we shut them down, that means just having to find a lot more power capacity, and that's all the challenges 
that go into you know ensuring that's reliable, building out that new infrastructure. It's very challenging. And obviously, um, one of the most heartening things you see is every time one of those countries, Germany, et cetera, says that they're going to keep their nuclear power plants open. One of the you know worst things you see is that two weeks later when they say, well, maybe not. We just got another headline 45 minutes ago saying maybe not. So it's, you know we don't know what's going to happen with that. But in terms of building new nuclear power plants, I am not very optimistic about the United States doing that. And the, the basic reason is this. I mean, so remember, the whole challenge with the electricity grid is you have to always manage exactly how much is being provided with how much is being demanded. And so that means the least valuable source to you is one that you can't control when it goes on and off. And that's so that's like an intermittent source. Um, but there's really like to oversimplify four categories of sources. So you have that intermittent supply, which is like you're already trying to balance this grid. And this one, you don't have any control over. So that's not very valuable. Right. Even if it's cheap to, to provide. Um, the next least valuable is frankly, a baseload source where it's just always on because sources like coal is a little bit different, but coal and nuclear um, tend to sort of just be on or off and kind of run straight out. And keep in mind, that doesn't help you meet the peaks in demand that happen over the course of the day. You need something else, a ramping source to fill that up. And in between that baseload and that peaking capacity, which typically is met by natural gas, maybe in the future will be met more by batteries or other technologies, geothermal maybe, um, you have maybe like a load following source that can kind of ramp up a little bit when more electricity is required and a little bit down. And so I would say that nuclear, the big challenge for nuclear is that frankly, the combination of renewables plus natural gas is very cheap in the United States and has historically made it very difficult to justify the massive investment in a new nuclear power plant, in part because we have a very fragmented regulatory system where the um, where re cost recovery for those nuclear power plants is determined in these individual state proceedings. So it's hard to have the kind of um, economies of scale that have typically led to big booms in nuclear power. So I'm more I'm more, um, I, you know, I think there will continue to be a boom of renewable energy. I don't think that's very important because it basically just means you use your natural gas plants more often, but you can't depend on them. Um, I think the, uh, as for nuclear, I'm a little skeptical. I'm more bullish on its chances in places that really need to massively expand their electricity supply, including their baseload supply, like, uh, like India, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I would love to be proven wrong. Let me make a couple of comments there on nuclear and renewables. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is the, the lens for this whole discussion is, is national security and energy security. And, you know, one thing I would say is when it comes to nuclear, a lot of the problems, James, that you mentioned about the oil and gas industry and, and um, lack of production in the oil and gas industry are, are true in spades in the nuclear space. That is, we haven't built a new nuclear power plant in the United States in about 40 years. There's one under construction now, it's a Vogel plant. Um, and, you know, when that happens, you know, U.S. domestic capabilities, human capital, uh, human resources, the ability to do it, um, and the ability to be a leader in the civilian nuclear power space is, is degraded. That, that capability is degraded. That's bad for U.S. national security. Setting aside the economics that you were discussing about sort of how we've set up the economics to, to provide our, our citizens with the, you know, affordable, uh, reliable, um, uh, and hopefully as clean as we can get power, um, you know, there, there are these externalities where the civilian nuclear power industry and the U.S.'s um, role as a leader in it is a pretty important national security um, feature in and of itself. Um, and so, you know, uh, we, we could talk a, a lot about nuclear. It, it is sort of a whole lot of power, at, you know, at low emissions, no emissions, more or less. Um, and, and so how to sort of deal with that is, is hard to know. There are a lot of advances in nuclear that that are promising. There's sort of a joke among some folks in the nuclear industry that whether it's uh, whether it's fusion or small modular reactors or whatever it is, that that's the future of the nuclear industry and it always will be. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that's not true because um, I think there are a lot of substantial advances and, and the federal government has been very involved in that. The U.S. The national labs, 
um, and and the Department of Energy are have been very involved. And you know, here in the the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, you know, uh, there is a tax credit for nuclear. There. Uh, specifically designated for nuclear. So, so I, I'm interested to see where that goes in terms of nuclear. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of positives if we can find our way past the regulatory, or not past, but, but, you know, to work through the regulatory challenges that we have as well as the um, uh, uh, regulatory, political, and, and economic challenges. That sounds like a lot. Um, if we can find our way through that, then you may end up on the other end with a, a really valuable source of, of massive amounts of energy. So I don't want to um, sleep on that. I think it's there's such tremendous promise there um, from a security perspective. And, and when it comes to renewables, um, well, let me, let me step back one, um, one spot. And that is, James, you talked a lot about uh, transport, transporting energy, whether it's transmission lines. And as we as we sort of move to this electrification of everything, um, you know, transmission is critically important, um, uh, and the fragility of the grid, as you described it. And I guess what, what I would say there is um, that's that's no joke. And the the uh, being sure that we have a grid that is secure is extremely important to say the least. And so. Um, you know, there's there's an interesting, rather small and under the radar kind of regulatory story. I won't get into the weeds of it, but fundamentally, the previous administration issued an executive order having to do with equipment that you connect to the bulk power supply to the bulk electrical system um, that we shouldn't essentially uh, that prohibiting companies from attaching things to the grid in critical ways that are manufactured by uh, adversarial nations like China. That the Biden administration. Um, Suspended that order upon taking office. I think the I think the concern was that that um, that that order somehow impeded the development of renewables, but but I, that's speculation on my part. And then you know ultimately uh, revoked that executive order and our and that that rule. But at the same time, you know I think the, the current administration is clearly grappling with that problem as they should be. Um, you know, how do we keep the grid safe and secure? I mean, that could be one of the greatest energy security issues that, that this administration, the next one, whoever it is, uh, are going to be facing as long as we're going to be increasingly relying on the grid. And that's not to say I want to overemphasize the fragility of it, but um, it is very complex. And, and um, you know, things like that having to do with supply chain, where we're getting equipment that's um, that's attached to the grid is, is important. I mean, our grid, interestingly, of course, our grid is not one grid, but a patchwork of multiple grids throughout the country. That is a benefit and a, and a detriment, depending on how you look at it or, or what should the context is. So just a couple additional thoughts there on um, you know, su supply chain, nuclear. Yeah. We have one more question for you both, but first I want to pause and invite the audience to get your questions ready. So Jack, could you please share with the audience how they'll, how they'll submit questions for? Sure. Uh, you can enter your questions in the, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, but we actually already have a couple. Um, if you'd like, uh, I could read them off for you. Uh, oh, well, one more question for the panelists and then, and then okay. we'll, uh, great, great. we'll come back to that. Um, Sounds good. This last question is, we talked about a lot, right? We've talked about oil and gas. We've talked about the conflict that we're seeing in the world today. We've talked about the energy transition. Given all of that together, do you view energy as a source of fundamental strength or weakness for the United States and our position in the world? And I'd ask the same question about our allies and our adversaries. Yeah, so undoubtedly, it's an area of our strength. I mean, we're the, we are by far the world's number one oil producer. We're by far the world's number one natural gas producer. We are uh, the number, at least at the start of this year, we've been the number one liquefied natural gas exporter. And I mean, frankly, we, you know, we have the resources, markets and industry to help the world, uh, you know, basically get through the current crisis, smooth prices um, and move towards cleaner energy. Because, you know, the world as a uh, as a whole, the biggest source of electricity worldwide by far is coal. And so our liquefied natural gas exports are helping the world get it off of coal. They're helping the Europe 
get, you know, remove its dependence on Russia, get through this crisis. They're helping a number of developing nations uh, expand their electricity supply. So, it's, you know, undoubtedly that our our resources help the world, uh, you know, uh, um, are helping the world transition to cleaner energy sources and more secure and reliable uh, energy sources. OK, with that said, we face a big challenge, which is that critical minerals, um, some of the minerals that are most necessary for the energy transition is a very different story. So, you know, if you look at um, some of those minerals like lithium or cobalt that are most cre key to ramping up, you know, battery or uh, electric vehicles, we're not in the top 10 producers, right? Um, if you look at, you know, processing of those critical minerals, about uh, more than half of most of them takes place in China. So we uh, have some serious um, security deficits that if we're gonna go very rapidly to these you know, new energy sources, we're putting ourselves in a position of dependence on some of these other places. So I think you know, sort of the, the short term and the you know, current transition from coal to natural gas, et cetera, I think we're very strongly positioned for that. Um, some of those longer ones, I mean, clearly we're either gonna have to figure out some way to permit a lot more mining in the United States than we traditionally um, have done, a lot more access um, to these minerals or uh, figure out, you know, some other um, some other ways of addressing them, whether, you know, it's carbon capture, you know, increased use of hydrogen, et cetera. So there's a lot of uncertainty about that long term future, but there are some challenges on the horizon. Um, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. It's a strength. Um, we are um, and not just in one or another area, but almost every area of potential energy production. Um, and technology, we are a leader. Again, I'll put in a word that very much among sort of general public underappreciated the U.S. national labs and, and how much investment goes into energy technology there um, that, that, you know, hopefully will redound to, and does redound to the benefit of, of all of us. Um, I'll, I'll pick a little bit with the, um, I'll, I'll share a brief thought on the, um, the concept of energy transition or the terminology of energy transition. I do think we use that term all the time and, and it often obscures more than it reveals the way we use it. Um, because my friends at the, at the Baker Institute here in, at Rice University in Houston and the Center for Energy Studies there will, will always tell you we call it energy transitions because it depends on, um, you know, it's not this one thing. It, it's very dependent on geography you know, you're transitioning from one thing to another thing, depending on what you've got and, and all sorts of other factors. Generally speaking, I'm not trying to, to quibble, I mean, generally speaking, you're talking about movement toward more electrification and toward uh, lower emissions sources of energy, and, and, that's, and that's fine. The other, the other point I would make just to, to parrot my, my friend, the former Secretary of Energy, Dan Burlett, um, he, he likes to say that we, we talk about energy transitions, again, you know, in terms of moving to lower um, emission sources, but um, really we've never transitioned away from any source of energy. Um, we've just used more and more and more. And the mix may change, but, um, but fundamentally, when you look at historically, uh, with the, maybe the exception of whale oil, we've, we've not transitioned away from a, from a source of fuel. Even now you're looking at the increased use of biomass, which again is, is, is wood. Um, and so, so you know, President Carter in the speech I mentioned earlier said we've had two energy transitions. One was a couple hundred years ago from wood to coal, and the other was a, a few years ago from, uh, from coal to oil and natural gas for transportation. Um, but some others might argue, as I said, that, that we've really just used more and more, and that doesn't appear to be going away anytime soon. So I know we want to leave a few minutes for questions. It looks like my friend John Melko has asked a couple in the comments here. So uh, <laughs> well, I, don't that's know. A, I don't know which one we're uh, going to take, Mr. Moderator. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a feast of questions here. We'll, we'll get through as many of them as we can in, in our next five minutes here. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll start with your friend John. He, he asked, uh, Carter's policies were in the face of peak oil and the belief that there were no substantial natural gas reserves obviously, which has changed in the, in the decades since, particularly through, through shale revolution. So John asks, if offshore and onshore restrictions are returned to historic levels, circa 2019, and pipeline permitting issues, U.S. would again be a net exporter, wouldn't it? So the question is, would the U.S., is the U.S. a net exporter today, and would the U.S. be a net exporter again without, without uh, restriction? 
Well, I guess I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm just to be sure I'm following the question. I mean, could essentially what would it take for us to be a net exporter again? Is that is that kind of what we're getting at? I mean, I think that I think that John's um, question does hit it sort of. Um, you know, James mentioned earlier infrastructure, um, infrastructure permitting issues, um, and there there's no question that the ability to build the infrastructure to transport the energy is is one of the biggest impediments we have right now. I do think, um, you know, I'll 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 um, give a nod to um, a Federalist Society webinar from about a week or two ago, um, where where former DOJ lawyer Eric Grant mentioned that you know NEPA reform it talked a lot about NEPA reform and how much we need it. I, I I agree with that generally. It's more comp you know I think it's complicated as to what that reform would be, but I, I think if if permitting were to ramp up. And first of all, I don't think that's going to happen by just saying to the federal bureaucracy, go faster. I don't think that typically works. I think, you know, more meaningful and, and comprehensive reform is required. But but I think absolutely um, the U.S. has the ability to be a huge net exporter of energy. Um, and it, and it's that's a huge source of our power. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, and uh... The answer is, uh, yeah, I think we are a net, uh, likely to be a net petroleum products importer. But I, I mean, really, these are huge volumes both ways, and they almost net out to zero, and they and they have. But I think the, um, you know, I think when you think about energy more broadly, uh, we are now a major net exporter because of our natural gas exports, and that's you know that includes both the liquefied natural gas exports uh, to. Uh, you know, to Europe and Asia, but also our um, natural gas exports to Mexico. So I think, you know, the world, I mean, the thing is a little bit comical about the president running off to, you know, Venezuela or wherever else asking for oil is the rest of the world, when they want more oil and gas production, they're looking to the United States. We are, and we undoubtedly, um, we undoubtedly have that potential. And, you know, it also, um, you know, we've we've had challenges because we didn't have enough infrastructure where we're flaring natural gas, just burning it off because we can't get it to the markets that desperately need uh, that desperately need that natural gas as a cleaner source of energy. And so we can, you know, both improve the economics of our industry, but also its environmental performance, while at the same time helping address the environmental and economic challenges of the rest of the world that needs more energy, you know, critically needs more energy supplies, but also needs alternatives uh, to coal, cleaner alternatives uh, for their air quality. So I think uh, we have a potential role uh, to play in both those respects. Great. Another question here from Tom Palmer. He says a section or component of our grid in California was attacked a few years ago. Was the origin of that solved? And are we doing something across the country to protect our grid you know, from, from cyber attacks and other malicious actions? I'll I'll maybe take the second part first, and and the answer is I mean I I, I think in the in the um, previous administration I know the Department of Energy, of Energy was very focused on grid security, and not just that agency but others as well. Um, you know, um, uh, so I think it is most of the people who are truly experts on the grid, uh, utility companies, the owners of the infrastructure, as well as um, government folks uh, who are focused on cybersecurity and things like that are focused on. I don't know the answer on that specific attack in California, but I would say just for an example of how some of this works, it's all very public. What in, in I believe it was December of 2015, um, the Russians tested their ability to um, uh, attack or tinker with the, uh, the Ukrainian grid, um, you know, and, uh, and I had a, there was a malicious attack where where they interrupted. I, I believe it was a substation there. It's just sort of an example of the types of vulnerabilities we're talking about. But um, uh, I think there are many, many folks, the experts who who manage the grid, who are most definitely focused on the issue and, and being sure that, that we're decreasing those vulnerabilities as best we can. Yeah. So I, I think the question is about this 2013 like rifle attack on a you know on a substation and. I don't think we ever actually found out who was responsible for that, although there was some suspicion it was an insider, at least that was reported. Um, you know, I think, but I do think, yeah, the cyber attack side is certainly an area that there is growing 
uh, concern about with what you know what happened at with the Colonial Pipeline um, shutting down uh, you know sort of uh, refined product supplies to the East Coast, and you know some question whether to what extent uh, Russia as a country was involved. So um, so yeah, it's uh, it's certainly a big issue going forward. Great. And last question. I think this is a good one to end on here. This is from Christoph Lutz, who asks, given the current situation, how long do you believe it will take Washington to reevaluate the priorities of U.S. energy policy? Do you think that or do you believe that CO2 reduction will stay as important for U.S. energy policy as it is today? Well, James, you got that one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, it's an it's an interesting question. Um you know, I'm well. It's it's hard it's hard to say because certainly during um, President Biden has been less extreme than he promised in his campaign because he made some very extreme pro, you know promises and it was sometimes difficult to tell what he was saying. But he but he said you know he said look in my eyes I'm going to end fossil fuels. He said he was going to stop not only new leasing but new permitting as well. Um, and which would have been you need even if you've already paid for your lease, you need a permit to drill a well. So that would have been an incredibly radical step and you know, legal. But what you know, it would have been uh, but something that could have made a lot of trouble for oil and gas companies. So um, so, you know, when he started making steps from back from that, I was hopeful that he would move towards a more pragmatic uh, energy policy. So far, we haven't seen that. I mean, in fact, you know, it's like every day they propose another terrifyingly bad uh, policy or they leak one so that they're, you know, like there's been the suggestion, oh, maybe they would ban uh, refined products exports from the United States, which would cause massive problems for our allies, for our trading partners, for the developing world, um, and likely, unfortunately, not help. I mean, it would probably help prices here in Texas, but it would uh, pro it may hurt prices on the U.S. East Coast given a lack of infrastructure. So, in any event, um, the you know there are uh, so there's a lot of bad policies that are floated and then not adopted. Now, you know, on the on the plus side, you say, well, at least they're not adopted. On the on the on the unfortunate side. These are exactly, you know, proposing extremely destructive and frankly bizarre things constantly is exactly the kind of thing that makes investors wary of investing in an industry, right? I mean, you know, and fundamentally the challenge is when you're investing in an industry, you have to, it's often gonna take 10, 15 years, et cetera, to get a return. And so when the president has never really officially backed down from his promise that he's going to and your business and you know do his best to bankrupt you it's kind of uh it's a challenge to get investment in those areas and so um you know i would say that mostly the policy has been incoherent i mean it's been one day we want we want more refining we want more production and then you ask well do you really want more refining five years from now and they say well maybe not and so uh, i don't think they've established a uh, coherent policy and i think if they did that would give investors a lot more certainty, but given how long it's been and given that they haven't gotten there yet, I'm a little bit skeptical that they'll get there. George, last word. Last last word is, is I agree and defer to Professor Coleman on that one. I, I agree. I don't think the policy, it's, it's really hard to tell where it's going to go. And, and I don't, I don't see any real viable, strong consensus developing and until the you know there there are a lot more uh, first of all until um the congress steps up and and sort of exercises its proper role in our structure of government and actually sort of really helps set policy because i think the, the executive seems to be to kind of play off of james's comments very much um and this isn't just you know unique to this administration but also kind of darting from one headline to the other, today's problem to tomorrow's problem, but, but not to sort of a, a real long-term perspective. So I, I think it's really hard to know when we'll congeal or when we'll kind of cohere in, in one sort of set of energy priorities, absent, I hate to say it, a, a very clear present crisis. Great. Well, George Fibb, Professor James Coleman, both energy experts and impressive thinkers. Thank you guys both for making time to join us today and share that expertise. And thanks to the audience for tuning in. Thank you all for your time, we're adjourned. <laughs>